one of those pins, we created a delegate that's going to take us to that details view of that property, right? Exactly. So then this is, this is where this is where the delegate is. So the delegate is right here. Uh, it's, a, it's a different type of delegate from what .NET developers are used to. So it's just the same naming convention. Uh, but a delegate is basically a class that you assign to uh, this object. Uh, so the you assign to the delegate property. Um, and you have more functionality within that delegate to customize uh, the map view or do, do different things. Um, so it is a little bit different. Uh, the name is the same, but conventionally it's different because it's that's what they use on the iOS. All right, um, well, let's see it in action. So here's the application again. We got our list view still working. We can navigate back and forth. We'll swap over to the map view, and you can zoom in on the map. You can click on one of those, and you can navigate back and forth. Great. There you go. So that, in a nutshell, is how to add maps. Now, there, there is a lot of code in there. Um, you know, the code will be made available. Uh, but in a nutshell, we now have a fully functional application to show uh, heritage properties uh, from the town of Oakville to in a list view, in a um, map view, and showing the details of the uh, of the heritage property. So to recap, uh, essentially what we've done is we've gone through how uh, iOS uh, Xamarin iOS works, application lifecycle. We started. Uh, we used uh, UI table views, UI storyboards, map kits uh, to build a fully functional iOS app using uh, using Xamarin and Visual Studio. All right, so that wraps up module two, uh, where we looked at the iOS applications. We'll come back and do uh, uh, Android. We'll do cover the same kind of material, but we'll actually start breaking into some some code reuse. So we're not doing this uh, two or three times. We'll we'll start sharing some of this code uh, between our applications. Yep. So we'll see you in Module 3. All right, welcome back to Module 3 uh, of developing cross or cross-platform development with Xamarin and Visual Studio. I'm Brian Schoen and I'm here with Mark Ortega and we're going to jump right into Module 3. All right, so uh, welcome back everybody. Thanks. Uh, for joining us again. So in the last module, we built out an iOS application uh, for heritage properties to list them on a list view, on a map view, and show the details to navigate uh, and navigate back and forth. Uh, in this one, we're going to do the exact same thing, but on Android and using Xamarin uh, to get things going. So as a quick overview, what we're going to do is we're going to get a uh, Xamarin Android application uh, working we're going to go through how it works, how Xamarin Android works, uh, the app life, life cycle uh, from, for Android. Uh, because we already have an existing application on iOS and we have some c -sharp code, we're going to start exploring some code sharing techniques. Uh, then we're going to use uh, list view, intents, map fragments uh, to finish uh, building out an uh, Android application using Xamarin. So again, you're probably... Uh, familiar with the slide if you've seen some of the other modules, but uh, essentially what we have is we have uh, C-sharp. Uh, Xamarin takes uh, your C-sharp and you're able to compile down to native code on iOS, on iOS and Android and use that same C-sharp code on the Windows platform. Uh, now on the iOS side, you have something called ahead of time compiling uh, or AOT uh, and it compiles down to native code. And on, on a the Android side, uh, what it uses is JIT compiling. So if you're familiar with C-sharp and .NET framework, uh, it's the same type of JIT compiling that happens uh, in the .NET framework. So your C-sharp is compiled to IL and placed in an APK. And then on the device, um, the IL is compiled down to native code. So it has its own uh, runtime. So it's very similar to the, to the .NET framework, the way it works. So this is a little bit different than the iOS model in that now we're building that IL code that's being interpreted when we run it, rather than actually building a, a completely native code base 
when we deploy it to the store. Yes, and uh, essentially what happens there is because you have the, the restrictions from Apple to only have native application or binary based applications in the App Store, uh, you have to compile down to native code. And in Android, you know, it's a little bit more uh, free for all in that, in that store. Uh, so you could uh, submit uh, IL code and then do the compiling on the fly. So now the Android runtime model, the way it works is you're going to have your Android OS, OS and then you're going to have your APK, uh, which includes your IL code and any resources you have in there. And then wrapped around that is you're going to be your mono VM. So you're, the VM is going to be there to interpret your code, and it's going to be a bridge to the Davlik or Art virtual machine which is part of Android. And you're going to be using either Davlik or Art, depending on what version of Android you're on. Uh, but Mono will communicate the interop between uh, the Android VM and your code. So you could get down into native code. So you could access, just like iOS, you could access uh, on Android, you could access Google Play, support libraries, activities, fragments. And you could also do some bindings into, uh, into Java uh, libraries that are available for uh, Java developers. Okay, so these native APIs, again, we have the full access to the Android platform uh, with the, the sensors and, and all those things that are in our phone, but it's being provided to us through this, this mono VM, which is that .NET framework running on uh, a non-Microsoft platform. Exactly, and uh, well, what uh, Xamarin does, it, it provides a bridge into the, uh, into the Java VM. Uh, Davlik or Art, and uh, that what that is what communicates down into the native platform. So, uh, like in iOS, we have um, uh, application life cycles in, and structure in Android also. So again, Android notifies us of all these different states and changes. Uh, so when a user uses your application, uh, it's going to go from not running. Uh, it's going to come into the foreground, and it's going to go into the active. And potentially, you know, a phone call comes in or they push the home button or anything like that, um, you, you're going to get paused, partially obscured, and then you're going to get stopped or backgrounded. Uh, so you're going to go into the background. And then from there, you could either get, go into the not running state, you could get into the restarted state, and go back into the active state. Uh, so similar to iOS, if you, you know, the names are a bit different, uh, but essentially the logic is almost the same. So now in activity.cs is where we're going to get our, uh, our notifications for states, and we have overrides in there, similar to iOS. Um, and the, these are coming straight from, uh, from the Java uh, SDK. So it's not something that Xamarin made up in, ter in terms of the states or anything like that. So you're going to have your not running, and then you're going to be active. You're going to get on create, on start, on resume. And then you're going to get, uh, you know, if a phone call comes in, you're going to get pause. You're going to get the on pause state. Uh, you're going to get backgrounded, you're going to get on stop, and then you're going to get restarted, you're going to get on restart, on start, and then on resume again. And then eventually you may get destroyed, uh, and again, you can't rely on the destroyed uh, method being called. Right. And one of the things I really like about what Xamarin's done here is that they kept all of the uh, Apple flavor of MVC for when you're doing those those iOS applications and here in the activities we've kept the activity model so if you've been doing Android development in Java you're still following that same familiar activity model but we're doing it in C sharp exactly exactly I mean we uh, I just finished some training a few weeks ago and one of the developers was a uh, Java developer but in the enterprise he was writing C sharp uh, after the training he's like yeah I'm gonna start using Xamarin and C sharp and start you know, leveraging the skill set because I'm in C sharp all day. Uh, why not use it for uh, for my apps that I release personally? So it's um, definitely something uh, people should look at if you're in C sharp and Visual Studio all day. So now one of the things uh, we have some existing code uh, from the iOS app. So we want to look at some code sharing techniques. So some initial code code sharing techniques. So we have uh, first one is conditional compiles. So conditional compiles, you have an if def uh, block. Uh, essentially, what you could do is you could enable or disable pieces of code depending on which platform you're on. So on iOS, uh, you have a default one, underscore, 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 iOS, underscore, underscore. Um, and I'll show you that. But in Android, you have the same thing. And on the Windows phone, you have Windows, Windows underscore phone. And then uh, on the full framework, you have the same thing. This is great for when you have subtle differences between the different platforms, but essentially a lot of the code 
is the same. For example, here we have a, uh, a database file path property, uh, a getter. So if you notice on the Windows Phone side, it's just one line. On iOS and Android, we have two lines with slightly different implementations. So the doc path is actually the same. But then the, if you look at the system.io.path, in iOS, we need to uh, put it within the library. So we need to go one directory down into the library and then grab the file name. Whereas in Android, you don't need to do that. So when you have these slight dif uh, uh, differences within the platforms, conditional compiles are a great way to do it. Partial classes are another way to, uh, to share code. So with partial classes, you could have shared func functionality in one code file, and then you have platform-specific functionality in a different code file. For example, on uh, this data model, we have a WP8, uh, uh, datamodel.wp8.cs and datamodel.cs. So what the compiler will do is it will compile it down to one class, even though the, they're in two separate files. Uh, so the compil compiler is smart enough to know that it can. this is only one class and shouldn't be separated. So going back to that code share, that the compiler directive that we had before, I would put that property in, in a separate file like this? Is that...? Uh, you, could, you could use both. So Sometimes what I find with conditional compiles, once it starts getting uh, very big, once you have properties, you know, one or two lines, you could use a conditional compile. But once it starts getting uh, slightly bigger, for example, here in the next slide, um, we need to get the folders. So getting folders on Windows Phone is different from getting folders on iOS, is different from getting folders on Android, potentially. Um, so we want those different implementations. Sometimes we want to separate it out into different physical files. So it's a little bit more organized, right? Uh, if you start having a lot of conditional compiles, uh, your code could get a little bit messy um, and a little bit harder to maintain. All right. But with that, that's where shared projects comes, comes into play. So shared projects, uh, you could create a shared project, uh, file new shared project, and then what it gives you is it shares code um, between different files. So one of the things, it kind of gives you this context switcher right at the top up here, where you see here. So you could switch between, say, iOS and Android implementations. And this will take into account the condition of compiles. So in the past, it was really hard to do this. But now with, the, with uh, shared projects, you could actually switch between uh, you know, what it's going to look like on iOS and what it's going to look like on Android or what it's going to look like on Windows. So in that, so when you switch from Android to iOS, you'll see that there, it's grayed out. And the active code is not grayed out. So that's where the conditional compiles come in. And then in uh, a future module, we'll be doing some, um, uh, some shared uh, partial, some partial classes with platform-specific implementations on things. All right. So how shared projects works is essentially you have a, uh, you have a project type, an SH uh, project. Uh, and then you have your C-sharp C files in there, your image files, your data files. Anything like that is in that shared project. And then no assembly is actually produced. Uh, the projects that reference it will actually produce an assembly uh, or take that code and produce the assembly for you. So the shared projects don't actually produce anything. So essentially, the, uh, how that works is the iOS, the Android, and the Windows application will share the sh uh, will have a reference to the shared project, and it will pull in uh, once it's compiled time. It will pull in those files and compile it into its own assembly. Okay, so this is different than a portable class library because the code is actually going to be uh, imported into my project and compiled as part of that project, rather than a separate library that will be. Uh, brought in and yeah. that's pre-compiled that each project then just references. Exactly, exactly. So it's, it's definitely a good way to do it. Those are your two options, portable class libraries and shared projects. And we'll go through portable class libraries also. OK. So now we'll hop into our first demo. And we'll just explore some of the application lifecycle and structure for our Android app. So I'm going to continue with the same project that we, uh, that we did module two in when we built the iOS application. And I'm going to add an Android project. So I'm going to add blank app. See here, Android's already selected. And 
heritage. I'm going to call it heritage property dot droid. I'm going to click OK. And you notice here we have our, uh, our main activity. And what we're going to do is we're going to set some going to set some icons in here just so we could have these available. So you notice we just have a bunch of drawable uh, folders at different uh, DPIs. So we're going to drop it into the resources. And we're going to apply to all items. And now we have all the drawable icons here. And these are just icons that we could set for different uh, resolutions. Uh, similar to what we did in iOS, but iOS we had to do it a little bit more uh, manually. We're going to create a shared project. And I'm just going to search it here. And I'm going to call it heritage properties shared. I'm going to click OK. And here you see we have our shared project. And I'm going to